So, what's new, what's hot? So I'm gonna cover three main topics. The first one is living kidney donors. Um, I think we just wanted to highlight some of the new data available about medical and psychosocial vulnerability. Obviously, we know that there's risk to living donors, and, uh, but I think we always need to remember that every person on dialysis or heading to dialysis is facing immediate imminent risk. So when I show you risk over 20 years, yes, we are concerned, but let's all keep it in the context of the recipients that we are trying to help. So I think one big thing that's emerging now is the question, what do we really know about donors in the long term? And the issue is because the inferences about the late risk of end-stage renal disease in kidney donors is predominantly based on sh fairly short-term data, less than 10 years. There's been a real push to get this data, but we don't have 20, 30-year data. So the thought is that ESRD that occurs after donation early, less than 10 years, may be different in its nature, its, its time frame, et cetera, from late ESRD. Therefore, to simply extrapolate data from early to late may lead us into a quandary. Now, one group has studied time-dependent ESRD incidents by starting with about 125 donors and observed them for about 11 years. They looked at the cumulative incidents, and here you can see the numbers are very small, 10 events in 10,000 uh, uh, donors at 10 years after donation, 85 events in 10,000 donors 25 years after donation. They noted that early ESRD was predominantly secondary to glomerulonephritis and that this incidence did not increase over time. The risk was stable over time. However, late ESRD was typically secondary to diabetes or hypertension, as we can imagine, and that there was an increasing incidence risk ratio over time of 7.7 .7, uh, for diabetes and 2.6 for hypertensive ESRD. So what does this look like? Um, we don't need to get into what the green line, the red lines all mean, but suffice it to say uh, in terms of how they're different. But what you can see is that with diabetes between years 10 and 20, the hazard rate actually increases sort of in a linear manner, whereas with glomerulonephritis, you can see that the hazard rate is very flat between 10 and 20 years. And then what this corresponds to overall is, I guess there's no pointer that's working, is that the cumulative incidence goes up much more steeply between years 10 and 20, again for diabetes and hypertension, but not for GN, which is kind of linear. Now, superimpose upon that thought, think about obesity. Currently, about 25% of all living donors are obese, defined as a BMI greater than 30, compared with much, much lower prevalence in the 1970s. Um, in the general population, obesity is increased with a 3.6-fold uh, risk of, um, a higher risk of ESRD. But in a healthy, more donor-like population, the adjusted risk was much, much less than 3.6. But we don't know what actually happens with donation of a kidney and therefore the reduction of nephron mass. <clears throat> SRTR data was used to study this, again, using about 120,000 living donor kidneys. Um, the time at risk was approximately 10 and a half to 11 years. They linked this data to CMS data for ESRD, and they defined ESRD as the earliest of dates for dialysis, transplant, waitlisting, or undergoing transplant. Baseline renal function at the time of donation was calculated by the CKD epi equation. The mean BMI of the obese donor was 33 versus 25 for the non-obese donors. Obese donors, as you can imagine, were more frequently men, African American, and they also had higher blood pressures. They were, however, comparable for age, 
the in starting uh, calculated GFR, smoking, insurance, and relationship to the patient. Now, in terms of, again, events per 10,000 donors, you can see that at every time point, the number of events for obese donors is higher than that for non-obese donors. So what is the actual risk associated with obesity? Here's a multivariable model that shows that the risk of associated with obesity is approximately one point, uh, has a ratio of approximately 1.86. Note that if you look at the relationship to the recipient, specific relation, if you're related to the recipient, your risk is 1.5. So again, these are all relative. Uh, these hazard ratios look significant, but overall, the incidence and, and the absolute numbers are very low. The effect of obesity, however, in, begins at a BMI of 27, and the ex, uh, adjusted hazard ratio is 1.07. The final thing I want to say is a little bit of our awareness of psych psychosocial vulnerability in both recipients and donors. It's been reported that prescription opioid fills in the year before kidney transplantation was associated with an increased risk of post-transplant complications. This is for the recipient. So the, the question is, therefore, does this also apply for the donor? Now, to look at this question, you have to link the SRTR database, and they chose to link it with Symphony Health Solutions, which is a pharmacy billing claim sort of database, um, as well as the University Health System Consortium administrative records to also look for hospital readmissions, et cetera. What we found was that 11.3% of our living donors filled one or more opioid prescriptions in the year before donation. The demographic risk factors for the highest tertile of opioid use, the highest group, the mo most prescriptions filled, were women, Caucasian, spouse to uh, relationship, obese donors, and unemployed donors. Medical risk factors for being in that highest tertile, tertile not turtle, tertile, um, included medical history. Of course, you know, if you're having medical problems, you're going to get uh, more likely to fill an opioid prescription. Uh, there was a 2.9% 90-day admission rate for living donors, and compared to no opioid use, there was a higher admission rate, as you can imagine, for people who used opioids in the year prior to donation with the adjusted odds ratios shown for the second and the third tertile compared to no opioid use. Now here it is graphically, you can see with no opioid use, level one versus the second versus the third tertile, it's a pretty significant hazard ratio. Other factors that were significant, African-American, but much more modest effect, specific relationships to the recipient, um, people who were uh, less than, uh, uh, had a pre-donation uh, pre EGFR of less than 60, that probably has something to do with medical issues. It's actually kind of surprising that these people were donors. Um, robotic surgery, I'm not exactly sure, and people with cardiac and pulmonary history. So I think we have been thinking about and trying to be more aware, um, and I think awareness is the key. We're trying to identify donors that might be at increased risk of requiring readmissions, which you know, connotes a more morbid uh, um, a donation process. So I think we want to carefully review historical and current opioid use. If we feel there's an issue, we should highlight that with, for our social worker. We're also doing a cures database query. And peri-hospitalization, we really need to provide the, apport, uh, the appropriate expert uh, um, to help deal with pain issues uh, during the hospitalization. So I think this talk, uh, this portion of the talk will be a lot easier and quicker uh, because of Raj's talk about uh, donor-specific antibodies and HLA antibodies in general. And the overall message here is the type of antibody, it's the quality and not the quantity. So 
Um, I wanted to share with you some information that's come out about the CPRA distribution and the DSA prevalence uh, that was uh, recently published. So about 500 consecutive transplants, a DSA was defined as a current or a remote anti-HLA antibody with a fairly modest MFI. Um, the patients who had no DSAs were given basiliximab induction, whereas the patients with positive DSAs were given thymoglobulin for uh, uh, the full course and, uh, or ATG fresenius with IVIG induction. There was no rituximab or bortezomib given, so sort of second tier uh, DSA treatments. Maintenance treatments was pretty comparable with tacrolimus and MPA being the workhorses. Those with DSA continued on steroids, whereas those without DSA had steroids discontinued. Uh, the first thing that's interesting is that they uh, showed us what the prevalence of uh, PRA was in their population as well as DSA. So you can see that approximately 50% of the population had a calculated PRA of zero, and then there was a, uh, uh, the rest of the population, you can see the curve in terms of the increase of CPRA. About one-fifth or 20% or so of the patients had DSA. Now here's a graph that shows you how sensitizing events contribute to DSA. Raj told us a lot about what types, what was the behavior of DSA based on these sensitizing events. But here what you can see is uh, there are people who have no sensitizing events that do have a CPRA. Those are, for example, the male single transplants that Raj was talking about. Uh, transfusions are a modest con contributor, but uh, here, again, pregnancies and previous transplants are the main contributor with respect to uh, uh, CPRA and sensitization. Now, DSA in the red line was associated with antibody-mediated rejection, but CPRA was associated with T-cell-mediated rejection. So you can see antibody-mediated rejection occurred at a very high rate for those with DSA, but T-cell-mediated rejection, perhaps reflecting the difference in uh, the induction, T-cell-mediated reje rejection was more common in the patients who had CPRA but not in those who had DSA. Again, perhaps reflective of the type of immunosuppression that they received. Here, what they showed is that DSA, but not CPRA, was associated with inferior graft survival. So even the people who were highly sensitized, so for example, the people who are in blue were had a CPRA of 51 to 100%. They didn't get super potent induction immunosuppression. They had pretty good graft survival, whereas those with donor-specific antibody had worse graft survival. So again, this is the type of antibody, the relationship in the re or the reactivity to the donor, and not just general sensitization. Now, the question is, is de novo antibody or pre-existing antibody uh, the culprit? And here, I'm telling you that de novo antibody is the devil. So here, this study looked at 770 kidney biopsies from many centers, both in North America and in Europe. Among these biopsies, 200 of them had antibody-mediated rejection as the diagnosis. About half of them were in patients with pre-existing antibody, and about half of them were in patients who had de novo antibody. The follow-up after the ABMR uh, was, you know, a little bit uh, longer for those with pre-existing, a little bit shorter for those with de novo. But what the graph shows you is first, the cumulative incidence of ABMR, those with pre-existing had ABMR very, very early and quickly after transplant. Those with de novo, as you might expect, developed ABMR more gradually after transplant because they're developing the antibody. Now, the pre-existing patients came in with sort of an even split of class one and class two. However, at the time of ABMR, there was more class two the MFIs were fairly comparable. The de novo people, if you compare the pre-existing and the de novo patients, again, at the time of antibody-mediated rejection, the de novo people had a preponderance of 
antibodies against class two, those DR and DQ antibodies that Raj mentioned, and the median MFI was considerably higher than those with the pre-existing. Again, the bottom here is at the time of the diagnosis of ABMR. Now, when they came to, uh, when they were diagnosed with ABMR, the two groups had very comparable EGFRs, but the de novo patients had more proteinuria and they had more abnormalities, histopathology, higher grade, based on all of these BAMF criteria uh, on the uh, uh, biopsy specimen itself. Now, if you look at graft survival, the pre-existing people have better graft survival than the de novo. And again, time zero is the diagnosis of ABMR. So if at the time of ABMR, this antibody was pre-existing, you tended to have a better outcome, whereas if it was a de novo antibody, you had a worst graft survival. And this can be further broken down to whether you had pre-existing in red, de novo in black, and whether you had CG lesions on your biopsy. So obviously, if you had CG lesions, you would have worse outcomes. If you didn't have CG lesions, you had better outcomes. So then, finally, we can see that putting it all into a multivariable model with pre-existing DSA as the reference group, a de novo DSA uh, situation at the time of ABMR carried an 80% hazard, increased hazard ratio of graft loss, along with factors such as the GFR, the proteinuria, and the transplant glomerulopathy score. So to round out this whole session, who gets de novo DSA? Well, unfortunately, it's the people who are non-adherent to the uh, immunosuppression regimen. And the question is, how do you measure non-adherence? Um, and I would suggest tacrolimus variability might be a good way. So non-adherence, it is, has a lot of bad associations. It's present in almost half of patients who have any type of rejection. It's an independent predictor of IFTA, uh, interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. It's an independent predictor of de novo DSA. It's an independent predictor of graft loss after de novo DSA. Non-adherence is a primary determinant of having very erratic, the sawtooth to crolimus level. Drug level variability can serve as an objective metric. It's a beautiful metric because this is data that's being collected. You don't even have to talk to patients. You don't have to ask them, did you take your pills? Did you forget? How often do you forget? You can just look at the data that's sitting in your computer and look at how variable the tacrolimus levels are. So here's the data that shows that non-adherence leads to de novo DSA. 500 low-risk adult and pediatric transplant recipients, kidney transplant recipients. The follow-up is for approximately 75 months. Non-adherence in this particular study was defined as a uh, patient admitting they were non-adherent, undetectable levels, not the variability, but undetectable levels, not showing up for clinic, not getting labs. Now, if you look at the previous graph that was here, shows the overall development of DSA in this population. Here, you can see that it's going to be broken down to the people who are non-adherent versus the people who are adherent. So it's a dramatic difference in the frequency of developing DSA, de novo DSA, relative to non-adherence. So here, we are now looking at drug level variability as the way to identify uh, non-adherence. 300 deceased donor kidney transplants, um, the, the, they determined that at the laboratory level, the variability was anywhere from 9% at the beginning of their study down to 6% at the end of the study because the labs got better and better in measuring tacrolimus levels. They calculated a coefficient of variation using all available outpatient values without correcting by dose. And you basically take the standard deviation, you divide it by the mean, and you multiply by 100. Here's the distribution 
So what you can see is about 40% had a coefficient of variability greater than 30%, coefficient of variation. The CV did not correlate with any donor, recipient, or transplant characteristics. It did not correlate with higher rate of acute rejection, but it did correlate with poor inferior one-year uh, renal function with the, uh, um, with, as shown here, 47 versus 52. Now here is the uh, de novo DSA curves. De novo de development, you can see that if you had that CV greater than 30%, you had erratic drug levels, you had much more development of de novo DSA. And here's death sensor graft survival, those who developed de novo uh, D DSA, uh, those who had uh, uh, high CVs also had worse graft survival. So CV is independently associated with development of DSA as well as death censored graft survival. So I think this is, again, there's many ways of measuring non-adherence, but this might be the easiest way and readily really available for everybody. So the final thing, I think instead of waiting for Godot, you might be thinking you're waiting for wine. Um, I think uh, I'm not a, I've told you many times before, I'm not a patient person, so I always feel like I'm waiting for Godot. Um, and I think what, how, how I wanna um, talk to you about this is what can we do for many of our candidates who have cancer to potentially think about accelerating their path to transplantation. So I'm gonna just speak about prostate cancer and then, uh, or prostate screening, and second, uh, about breast cancer. So the question is, should prostate cancer screening by PSA be part of the kidney transplant evaluation? And I think we all need to actually discuss this because uh, there's data um, about this question that's just come out. So why is prostate cancer singled out? The cancer itself is indolent, it basically doesn't kill people. It, PSA, the test itself, has very low specificity. The biopsies, the cancer treatment, lead to a lot of morbidity for a cancer that may not be super dangerous. Screening resulted in only borderline reduction of cancer mortality in a European study, and screening resulted in increased incidence of mortality in a non uh, uh, in a U.S. study. So these results published in 2012 has led to some different recommendations for screening. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force says no screening. And the American Urological Association as well as the NCI said we should only screen for the highest risk groups, men who are 55 to 69 years of age. So what is the impact of PSA screening during kidney transplant evaluation? This is a publication from 2017. I really apologize uh, for not providing uh, um, the reference down here, um, but let me just go over the results with you. So they looked at about 3,780 men undergoing primary kidney transplant evaluation over 10 years. The patients were grouped by age, those risk groups that I spoke to you about, less than 55, 55 to 69, so group two, that middle group is the high risk group, and then the elderly, greater than 69, the older group. Screening was performed in overall about 64% of these 3,700 people. It was, of course, highest in groups two and three at 82 and 84%. For all that screening, 163 people, 4.3%, were found to have prostate cancer. There was only one attributable death, and this person had a negative screening test result. Now, there was more cancer detected in those with positive screening, 26 versus 3%. But you know, some of these other facts may temper our enthusiasm for screening. Now, a positive PSA defined as greater than four delayed listing and transplant. So what you can see here is that here are the people who had no screening. Here are the people who had screening, 
but the test result was normal, negative, and here are the positives. And what you can see is these are the youngest group, less than 55. This is the middle group, because this, was, this effect was not seen in the older group. So what you can see is this lowest bar is um, referral to list, the middle bar is list to transplant, and then the darkest bar is the sum of the two, referral to transplant. And you can see clearly if you had a positive test, now remember this doesn't mean you have cancer, only you know, a small percentage of these people actually had cancer. If you had a positive test, everything took longer. But perhaps even more concerning is just the screening itself was independently associated with reduced likelihood of transplant. So in the previous slide, you were only looking at the people who got transplanted. Here, it looks, uh, you can see that if you had a high PSA, your likelihood of transplant was reduced by 41%. But even if you had a normal PSA, your likelihood of transplant was reduced by 22%. So I think we all have to, with this new data published in 2017, look back at the screening recommendations and really decide whether we want to continue screening and also what do we do with the positive results. So one more thought, very quick, can we better stratify risk uh, of breast cancer? So obviously everybody knows that there's all kinds of genomic assays now that are used to guide decision making for adjuvant therapy for breast cancer. A recent study of over 6,000 women showed that while you have 98% five-year distant metastasis-free survival for tumors that are low clinical and low genomic risk profiles, if you have bad clinical features but a low genomic profile, your five-year distant metastasis-free survival was 95%. So the genomic profiling is very potent over and above the clinical presentation. So can genomic profiles be utilized to evaluate tumor biology instead of just waiting, which is what we currently do, right? Why do we make people wait? We make them wait to prove themselves. Can we use the genomic profiling as a substitute for this weight. And Rita Mukhtar is one of the uh, uh, breast uh, uh, surgeons here at UCSF, and she published two cases where basically we indeed use the genomic profiling to accelerate the pathway to transplant. This patient, for example, underwent transplant one year after diagnosis. Uh, she had a fairly small tumor. Uh, it was grade two. It was. Uh, um, um, positive invasive ductal carcinoma considered uh, uh, hormone, uh, it was hormone uh, receptor positive. But this genomic uh, uh, diagnostic evaluations uh, yielded a numerical score, and this numerical score translated to very low uh, uh, recurrence rates over 10 years. This patient is now six years post transplant without any breast recurrence on standard triple immunosuppression, and basically a similar story can be told of the second patient. So I think we're all so, you know, sensitized, to use a, a NHLA word, as to this whole horrible waiting process for kidney transplantation. Um, I think we're trying to do so many different things to try to get people transplanted. That means being aggressive with living donors, even in spite of known risks, but taking that risks into account, and we want to know more about that risk. We're trying to deal with the pre-transplant sensitization. We're trying to make grafts last longer, and we need to think about uh, drilling down on people's adherence patterns, uh, using readily available data, and I think we need to to uh, make smart decisions about our evaluation process so that we are not the obstacles to transplantation, um, which, and I don't want to be a further obstacle to the fun night ahead. So thanks, everyone.